In this video we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation for our first model system and that system is called the particle in a box. So to introduce what this system is, let's draw a, the potential energy that acts on this particle. Okay, so we got the potential energy V of X here, which is our Y axis. And this is acting over some range of X. So from zero to L, so the width of the box is this quantity L, X increasing to the right. And then V of X, the potential energy acting on the particle that's gonna be somewhere inside this well, is going to be one of two possible values. Potential will be zero if the particle is inside the box somewhere. Zero is less than x, less than l, somewhere inside the box. And it's going to be infinity otherwise. So outside the box, the potential energy is going to be infinity. So in order to solve the Schrodinger equation, which let's remind ourselves is just going to be h psi equals e psi, psi being the wave function, h being the Hamiltonian operator, and then e being the total energy of the particle, this being an eigenvalue problem that we discussed. Um, then if we write this out in more detail, the Hamiltonian we have minus Planck's, reduced Planck's constant squared over two times the mass second derivative of the wave function with respect to x dx squared plus potential energy v of x times psi of x equals e psi of x. But then we immediately notice that since this p potential is infinite outside the box and it's zero inside the box, uh, the particle is going to be somewhere inside the box. So we're really not solving the wave function for the complete uh, minus infinity to infinity. We're really just solving it from zero to L. And the wave function is going to be zero outside of that because we don't want a particle with infinite potential energy because then the particle would have infinite energy. So inside the box here, this potential, as we said, is just zero. So this term just goes to zero. And then you should be able to convince yourself that if I do a little bit of algebraic manipulation and rearrange this equation, I can get the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x equals minus two times mass times e energy over h bar squared times psi of x. So again, just like we saw in the classical wave equation, what we end up with here, with, in the absence of potential energy acting on a particle, is the second derivative of a function equals a negative constant times that function. So whenever we have this situation here, um, it's a reasonable guess to assume that the solution looks something like psi of x is a function of sines and cosines. So we have a cosine kx plus b sine, not cosine again, sine kx. Okay, and that's a very, that's a very reasonable thing there to assume. Okay, so we can see directly here that if you differentiate this twice, what you're going to get is the same function back times a minus k squared. Each of these sine and cosine is going to pull out a k during each derivative, and then you can factor out that, k, that minus k squared, and you'll get the original function back times minus k squared. So this constant that we're looking here, this minus 2me over h bar squared, is equal to minus k squared. So then if we just end up solving for k, we would get that k equals 2me over h bar, and this top part here gets a square root. 
So just differentiate this twice and then substitute this in here and you'll see that you'll get a correspondence between k and this value here. Okay, then beyond that, we're going to start to use, just as we did for the classical wave equation, the boundary conditions for the problem at hand. We know that for psi for x is less than or equal to 0 is going to equal 0. So therefore, psi of 0 is going to equal 0. And similarly, since the particle can't be outside the box over here, it's infinite potential energy over there. We have x, which is greater than or equal to L, equals 0. So as well, we end up with the boundary condition psi of L equals 0. OK, so applying these boundary conditions to this functional form that we have here, we can say that psi of 0, which equals 0, is a times cosine of kx at x equals 0 is 0, plus b sine, and again kx at x equals 0 is 0. So let's see what this ends up being. Well, the cosine of 0 is 1, so this term becomes just a. Sine of 0 is 0, so this term becomes 0. So we end up that this equals a. So this means that a has to equal 0. So this cosine term here is going to go away. We're just going to have a sine term. Then applying the second condition, we have psi of l equals, equals 0 and it also equals b sine of kl. Now once again, we, we could make b equal 0, but we don't want to make b equal 0 because then the amplitude is just 0 everywhere. And the Born, the Born interpretation that we talked about last time is means that the square of the wave function is the probability of finding the particle somewhere inside of a certain region. So if we have a wave function with this, which is zero everywhere, then we have no particle. So we want to have a particle, so we don't want the solution of, of psi of x equals zero everywhere. We want the other solution. So if we think about the sine function, where does the sine function equal zero? Because this part is going to have to be the part that satisfies that. So just like we talked about before, sine looks like that. And it's going to equal 0 at 0, pi, 2 pi, etc. So it really equals 0 at some integer multiple of pi. So we know that this up here is also equal, going to equal b times sine n pi. Then looking at the correspondence here, we see that inside the sign here, we have this kl and n pi, and both of those have to equal the same thing. So moving forward with that, we'll have kl equals n pi, and then solving for k, we'll just get k equals n pi over l. Okay, so that's neat. We have our wave function then solved. So we have psi of x equals b times sine of kx, and substituting in k here, substituting in kx, we'll get n pi x over l, which if you'll notice from the vibrating string video is the exact same spatial part of the solution we get for the vibrating string. And that's really no coincidence. This is also a wave equation, and it has the same boundary condition. So the fact that we end up with the quantum solution being the same as the classical solution for the same wave problem is really no coincidence. It's just really going to be the in interpretation about what it means for the position of the particle, which is going to be different, for this example at least. And then that's our wave function. And then looking here, since we solved the value of k, we have k down here in terms of the total energy from our Schrodinger equation up here, this e psi here. We've solved for, we've solved for psi, 
So now let's solve for e. So looking at the fact that we have uh, k over here, which we know is n pi over l, we know that equals square root of 2m times e over h bar, substituting in from here. Then after enough manipulation and rearrangement, you should be able to arrive at e equals, and then that's going to be n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2m l squared. And then one thing that we're going to make use of to just make this a little simpler, we're going to make the, we're going to get this pi out of here. Since we know that h bar, the reduced Planck's constant, equals h over 2 pi, in this situation it's going to be more convenient for us to use h because we can get rid of these pi squared here. Then you should be able to convince yourself that if I substitute that in, I will get e equals h squared n squared over 8 mass times the width of the box squared. So that's the energy of our particle. And then up here, as we solved, was the wave function of the particle. So now we have officially solved the Schrodinger equation for our first model system. We are officially doing real quantum mechanics now. And in subsequent videos, we'll discuss more about what we now use this wave function for and how we use it to compute the properties of the particle, which is going to be somewhere inside this box.